A couple of months ago, I took a series of plane trips to go and see my brother's place in Texas, and each plane trip began and ended in a similar fashion. Right before takeoff, the pilot would get on and he'd say, flight crew, prepare for takeoff. And then right before we're going to land, he'd say, flight crew, prepare for landing. Now, I am not, nor have I ever been, a member of a flight crew, so I have no idea what these preparations for takeoff and landing actually include. But since they do it on every single flight I've ever been on in my life, I assume they're of some importance. And so I want them to make sure they are doing these preparations correctly. But that's true in other areas besides flying, right? Let's say you're going to take a long car trip. What do you do? Well, you should check the oil. You should check the tire pressure. You should check the washer fluid and so on. There are final preparations you make before you embark on your journey. That's in addition, of course, to the long list of things that you have to do to get yourself ready. Did I pack everything I was supposed to? Do I have enough clothes? Do I have a spare charger? Do I have all my pills, stinking pills that you got to remember to bring with you everywhere, right? Is my house taken care of? Are my pets looked after? There's so many things to prepare and consider. But you don't even have to necessarily be the one traveling. There's much to prepare if you're receiving the traveler. Is the guest room ready? When was the last time that bedding was washed, right? <laughs> what meals are we going to have? Am I, am I prepared to host someone? And so whether traveling or receiving the traveler, there's always some final preparations to be made when someone's coming to visit. Well, in our text today, it seems very much as though Paul has in mind the final preparations for his third visit to Corinth. There are things he wants them to know and to do before he arrives in order to make the visit the most that it can be. And along the way, we're going to learn some helpful things, both for those who are being ministered to and those doing the ministry. And as we know, we can fall into both of those categories because you ought to know by now that it's our desire around here that you're always investing in someone and being invested in, that you fit both sides of that coin. And so let's pay real close attention together to what applications these final preparations have for our lives today. And so turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. You saw on the screen there just a moment ago, our emphasis is on verses 5 through 10, but let's get Paul's whole thought in verses 1 through 10. This is the third time I'm coming to visit you. By the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter will be established. I said before when I was present the second time, and now, though absent, I say again to those who sinned previously and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He's not weak toward you, but is powerful among you. For indeed, he was crucified by reason of weakness, but he lives because of God's power. We are also weak in him, but we will live together with him because of God's power toward you. Put yourselves to the test to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Do you not recognize regarding yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail the test. And I hope you will realize that we have not failed the test. And we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong. Not so that we may appear to have passed the test, but so that you may do what is right, even if we may appear to have failed the test. We cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the sake of the truth. For we rejoice whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And, and we pray for this you may become fully qualified. Because of this, I am writing these things while absent, so that when I arrive, I may not have to deal harshly with you by using my authority. The Lord gave it to me for building up, not for tearing down. And so last week, we looked at the first four verses, and we noted that Paul was issuing a very clear warning shot. Whether you are ready for it or not, I am on the way. He was determined to get to the bottom of what was actually occurring in Corinth when he got there. And so what would he find? Would he find unrepentant sin? Would he find approval of sin? Only time would tell. But he wanted them to know, if he came and they were still making a practice of sin, he was going to have to deal with it, and he was not going to spare anyone. He also reminded them of the nature of Jesus' power. While it might have seemed like weakness in Jesus, up to and including the crucifixion, Christ now lives by the power of God. And those in Christ, those like Paul, live with him, united to him in what sinful human flesh might think is weakness, but is actual great power. And so as mentioned, today Paul's going to lift off some final preparations, things that the Corinthians must know and do 
before he comes. Because as much as this letter has been a warning in many ways, we have to remember, Paul wants a good visit. He does not want another tearful, painful visit. He wants it to be a good, edifying third visit, not a harsh, tearful one. And so the first thing he instructs them is the need for an honest examination. An honest examination. Throughout the letter, it's been very clear that Paul has been put on the defensive on a number of occasions. He's clearly stated the primary purpose of his letter is not a defense of his apostolic office and authority, but still the subject has come up over and over again. Most recently, he drew attention to the fact some of you are demanding proof that Christ speaks through me. And he mentioned it in a context of warning. If you want proof, just keep sinning and find out what happens next. You'll have all the proof you can handle. But now it's sort of like Paul has reached the point where he's tired of being put to the test. And so he sort of flips the script on the Corinthians, and in what proves to be a brilliant strategy, he tells them, you know what? You're the ones that need to be tested. Verse 5. Put yourselves to the test to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize regarding yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, indeed, you fail the test. So right, right off the bat, there's a word that jumps out of this verse. It's yourselves. Look at the emphasis. It's not just three times repeated in English. It's that way in the original. And in the original, it's emphatically positioned. Paul's making a point. You shouldn't be looking at me. You shouldn't be examining me. You shouldn't be putting me under the microscope. You should be examining yourselves. Take a good, long look in the mirror. And over the next three verses, he's going to repeatedly use a very specific term and then variations of that term to drive this point home. You're going to see things like put to the test, fail the test, not fail the test, pass the test. This word test and its various forms. The word at the core of all of this was used to describe the process of testing and approving precious metals. When you went through this series of tests and you were completed, you would know definitively whether or not what you had in your possession was the real deal. Is it genuine? We've been going through Peter. Peter uses the same word in chapter 1 for the tested genuineness of your faith on the other side of a trial. Here, Paul wants there to be no doubt. There's some necessary tests as part of the final preparations, and it starts with you, Corinthians. And so, well, what does he want them to test? Look what he says. Are they in the faith or not? And so, from a larger context perspective, it's a simple question. Are you really a Christian, or are you not? Have you really received the gospel message that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again on your behalf? And are you holding fast to those truths? But then in a narrower context, he's also asking them to determine, does my life reflect that reality, that I am in the faith? Because remember, Paul's concerned that there's going to be unrepentant sin when he comes to visit. So he wants them to think about their current conduct and whether or not that is in line with someone who claims to be in the faith. So he continues by drawing their attention to the fact that Christ is in them. He, the, the way he really says it is, don't you realize that Christ is in you? Unless, of course, he's not. And if he's not, well, that amounts to failing the test to being useless as it pertains to the faith. This whole thing is sort of meant to shake them up a little bit, to, to cause them to evaluate. Are my actions and attitudes in alignment with someone who is in Christ and Christ is in them? If you remember, Paul's opponents, the so-called super apostles, what was their rubric? They, they judge themselves by themselves and then they're delighted when they're approved, right? Well, here's Paul's answer. Know yourselves as those in Christ and evaluate yourselves according to the faith, not according to man-made standards. Make an honest examination of your walk and your claims to the faith. And we might expect them to go on and then give a checklist of all the things that they need to do, right? He doesn't do that. He doesn't give them specific criteria to judge their status in the faith. But he has given them plenty of checkpoints along the way. Even if you go back to the letter that we know as 1 Corinthians, there, there's many wonderful tests in there. In that letter, he told them, it's only those who have the Holy Spirit 
that can declare the lordship of Jesus. That is a wonderful test to know if you are in the faith. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is he the authority in your life that you are actively submitting to? Paul's also told me, flee sexual morality, flee idolatry. Those are good tests. Are you making a practice of habitual sexual sin? Are you an idolater? That is to say, are there things in your life that are consistently taking the place of the Lord Jesus on the throne of your heart? He challenged them in this letter regarding expressions of generosity. Remember that in chapter 7? It's a test of genuine love. And of course, recently he voiced his concern about finding, quote-unquote, less obvious sins present. Sins like quarreling, jealousy, intense anger, slander, gossip, arrogance, disorder. These are all good tests as a part of their self-examination. But again, it really came down to whether or not they could conclude that Jesus Christ was in them. Was that reality evident in the way in which they conducted themselves? Friends, we could use a little self-examination now and then. A little honest evaluation. Am I really living in the faith? Am I demonstrating the reality that Jesus dwells within me? Because let's just be honest here. There are far too many people walking around today that, that maybe many years ago at a camp, raise their hand, or at a revival service, walked an aisle, or at a normal service, walked an aisle, they prayed a prayer, but in reality they're anything but in the faith. People who may have been given assurance of salvation when no assurance was really warranted. People who are on the broad path that leads to destruction and they don't maybe even know it. And so an honest evaluation, an honest examination is very helpful. And if you don't know where to start, I, I want to do this, where do I start? Well, I would read 1 John. I think the Apostle John gives this wonderful criteria for what a believer. He, he says a true believer must have an awareness of their own sin, right? They, they must be committed to sound doctrine. They must consistently display a love for their brothers and sisters. And yes, obedience to the commands of Christ. According to John, someone who lacks these things, there's a good chance the truth is not in them. And so friends, if you're here and you claim that Christ is in you, do you actively pursue holiness? Are, are you striving to be separate from sin and devoted to God? Do you, do you long for fellowship with God, both in prayer and in His Word? Do you hate sin? I mean, do you hate sin? Who, who are you relying on more, God or yourself? These, these are hard questions, but necessary questions to ask ourselves. And so take that hard look in the mirror. And no, I'm not in any way, shape, or form talking about sinless perfection. I just told you that John said a sign that you don't have the truth is if you go, yeah, I'm perfect. I don't have any sin. No, no, no. That should be a huge warning flag. You've heard us say so many times around here, it is not about perfection, it's about direction. Are you orienting toward holiness, obedience, fellowship with God, and love for your brothers and sisters? In spite of the charge from Paul here and the warning that he issues, it's really not as if he expects them to fail in their self-examination. He expects them to conclude, yes, we are in the faith, and yes, Christ is in us. And when that happens, he expects they will come to a necessary realization. I told you, Marty, there's more, more ways to alliteration. A necessary realization. I imagine that Paul probably, you know, when he issued that warning, I think he probably did have a few people in mind, people that he knew from experience they really do need to examine themselves. They, they need to take this warning in because they might not be in the faith, that Jesus might not be in them. Remember what he said earlier in the letter? Don't be surprised when Satan's servants disguise themselves as ministers of light. Don't, don't be shocked when that happens. We could even think about Jesus' teaching on the parable of the soils. There are going to be people who initially look like they have some measure of faith, and when the heat gets up, they fall away because they have no root. Or when they get distracted by all the cares of the world, they're all of a sudden gone. Don't, don't be surprised at that. And so these warnings and evaluations are necessary. They're good. But that being said, I really think Paul has a larger purpose in issuing this command. Namely, to get the Corinthians to realize once and for all that he is not the imposter that the super apostles are claiming him to be. 
He's, he currently is, and he always has been, a legitimate apostle. And not just any apostle, their apostle. I want to just, just for a moment, all the way back to chapter 1, remember what Paul told him very early in the letter, what his hope for the future was? He said, I hope you will understand completely, just as also you have partly understood us, that we are your source of pride, just as you are also ours in the day of Jesus. What's he saying? Paul was eagerly looking to the day of Jesus, when Jesus returned, where he would gladly boast, <laughs> praise God, you are my church, Corinth, and where they would mutually boast, praise God, this is our apostle, Paul. That, that was a, a goal of Paul's, but if the Corinthians are still doubting the legitimacy of his apostleship, how could they celebrate him as their apostle? And so, as the letter begins to draw to a close, Paul does what he can to, but let's put this debate to bed once and for all. But let's be over this. He wants them to realize, you know what? The results of their self-examination, it requires them to conclude certain things. And that is that their statuses are inextricably linked together. And so he says this, I hope you will realize that we have not failed the test. Examine yourselves, test yourselves, see if you're in the faith, recognize that Christ is in you, unless he's not, but if he is, and I believe he is, well, then I hope you'll realize that we have not failed the test. You go, well, what, what test are you talking about, Paul? Is this the same test as the previous verse? Is he hoping the Corinthians will realize that he and his companions are, are also fellow Christians? Yeah, but more. There's a second test taking place in this verse. It's the test of the reality of Paul's status as an apostle. If you test yourselves and determine that you are in the faith and Christ is in you, then you must determine that I am who I claim to be. I am your apostle, a legitimate apostle in every way. Why? How are the two related? He already told them in 1 Corinthians, you have many teachers, but only one father. I, I'm your spiritual father. He's the one who brought them the gospel in the first place. And so if they receive that gospel, if they're standing firm in the faith, if they can conclude that Christ is really in them, well, wouldn't that verify that Paul is who he says he was? That he really carried the truth with him? That he was God's messenger? And he certainly believes he should. Notice what he says here. I hope you will realize. And we've noted it so many times, but it deserves noting again. This hope, biblical hope, is not just wishful thinking. There's a confidence Paul's expressing. If you give yourself a passing grade, I am confidently expected that you will give me a passing grade too. The word translated realize in our verse is more commonly translated know. I hope you will know. I'm confident you will know. But this isn't mere head knowledge. The word it connotes intimate knowledge, knowledge by experience of something. It's used in scripture as a euphemism for marital relations between a husband and wife. Joseph did not know, same word, marry until after Jesus was born. So Paul trusts the Corinthians will not just come to the conclusion that he's legit, he's confident they will walk away with an intimate knowledge of him. They'll recall his witness to them, they'll recall the enduring effect it's had on their lives, the reality that he brought them the message of salvation, and then they will know without a doubt, yeah, he's our apostle. By God's grace, he is our apostle. But in declaring his confidence, he also wants to make sure, yet again, that his motives are not misunderstood, and so he shares with them a, a prayer he has. The next thing to see is a hopeful supplication. The hopeful supplication. You ever known someone who consistently twists your words? Like, you, you sort of always have to be very careful about every single word you say because it might be taken out of context and then used against you. But let's just be really honest. <laughs> it is absolutely exhausting to be around someone like that. It's frustrating, it's taxing, it's infuriating. But from the way Paul writes, it seems to me like he encountered many people like that over his many years of ministry. Perhaps more than any other biblical writer. You ever notice that? Paul, as he writes, he anticipates the objection, and then he answers the objection. He anticipates, how might this phrase be twisted up and used against me, and let me set the record straight before that happens? Now, on the one hand, we know that that was a, certainly a work of the Holy Spirit carrying him along, guiding his pen. But 
On the other hand, it, it, it speaks to his experiences with the people he ministered to. And I would say especially as you read the letters to the Corinthians, you get the sense that they were often guilty of misunderstanding at best and of perverting his words at worst. And so here we have another scenario in which Paul proactively deals with a potential problem before it becomes an actual problem. So he just told them, I'm confident you'll pass the test. And when you do, you will intimately know that we pass the test too. But in case someone tries to say, well, that's all you really care about, Paul, he, he lets him in. This is my supplication. This is my prayer, which reveals my purpose. Now we pray to God that you may not do anything wrong. So that we may, excuse me, not so that we may appear to have passed the test so that you may do what is right, even if we may appear to have failed the test. And so Paul can hear it now. Paul, you're always defending your status, man. All you care about is whether people know you're an apostle. Stinking egomaniac. But he makes it clear. I'm not, I'm not praying for my own vindication here. I'm praying that you guys don't do anything wrong. It's such a broad, sweeping statement, is it not? You're like, man, what kind of cool hidden meaning is there? It is what it is. It's exactly what Paul is saying here. His prayer is that they would not conduct themselves in an evil, twisted, wicked way, but instead that they would do what is right, that which is good, honorable, profitable. Friends, don't allow the, supl the simplicity of the prayer make you pass by the insightfulness of it, the profundity of it. It's incredible. Think about it for a moment. Isn't that a prayer that we should all be praying for ourselves and for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Lord, I pray today that I would not do anything wrong, but rather what is right. It's so simple and yet so profound that I would not do the things my flesh may want to do, but the things that you find lovely. But we, we just talked last hour in 1 Peter about the passions of our flesh that wage war against our souls. Why would we not pray that we would abstain from those passions of the flesh? Why would we not pray the same thing for our fellow brothers and sisters? I don't know about you, but sometimes you're like, yeah, I would like to pray more deeply for the people I love around me. I would like to, to, to pray for them more thoroughly. Why not start here? What a wonderful example Paul sets for us. I pray you won't do anything wrong and that you will do what's right. Simple and yet challenging. A Christ-honoring prayer. I, I want to challenge you. Would you consider starting to pray that way? Today, tomorrow, the next time you go in prayer? Pray that. For yourself and for one another. Pray for me. I would so appreciate if every day you prayed, I pray that Andy would not do anything wrong today. And that he would do what's right. I can't imagine the power that might have in my life. That would be incredible. But between Paul's desire for them to intimately know he's their apostle and his prayer they won't do anything wrong, he understands some might conclude that he is self-serving in this. And so he addresses it head on. It is not about our status. If you are doing what is right instead of what is wrong, I could care less whether or not we look like we have passed or failed the test. But again, it's sort of confusing. Well, what test are we talking about? How could the Corinthians doing what is right and not what is wrong possibly make it look like Paul had failed? I mean, that's sort of a weird thing for him to say. I think it comes back to Paul's usage of authority. Remember what he said. If I come there and you guys are still sinning, I'm not sparing anyone. You want to know if Christ is speaking through me? You're going to find out in a hurry. But what happens if he gets there and they're not doing what is wrong? And they are doing what is right. Well, he has no need to exercise the severe side of his authority anymore. And so he supposes that there would be some who say, See, there he goes again, big and bad in his letters, weak and timid when he's in person. And so Paul clearly says here, I really don't give a rip if that's the conclusion that people come to. If you guys are doing what is right and I don't need to prove the more severe side of my apostolic authority, that's great. Who cares if it looks like I have failed the test? It's not my chief concern. My concern is for you and your holiness. And again, Paul's example is, is wonderful and challenging and humbling all at once because, friends, how often do we fight for dear life to protect our status? 
to make sure people think the very best of us. And sometimes in the process of defending ourselves, of, of trying to protect our status, we end up harming that of others. And so Paul turns it all around here. He sort of flips it on your head. It's about your sanctification and not my status. What, what a lesson for us, friends. Is your greater concern the holiness of your brothers and sisters or your reputation? These are challenging things for us to think through. We say, Paul, how'd you get to this point where, you, where your concern for the Corinthians clearly outweighs your concern for your own status? Well, we would say that he had the proper motivation. The proper motivation. People find motivation in, in any number of sources. Some people are, are just motivated by money. When I was a sales manager, that's something you would look for if you're hiring a salesperson. Motivated by money makes a good salesperson most of the time. Some people are motivated by status, by power, by advancement. Some people find motivation in approval. Some are motivated by love, others by fear. And yeah, some motivations are healthier than others, but, but they can be found in an abundance of sources. But for Paul, I think he would tell you that one of his main motivations was the preservation and proclamation of truth. Right after telling them he really doesn't care if people think he has failed the authority challenge, he says this, For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the sake of the truth. And so we have this word for, right? It undergirds both his prayer and his lack of care for how people view him. And then he states his inability to do anything against the truth, but only for the sake of the truth. And so then, okay, it's on us to narrow down, well, what truth are you referring to here, Paul? He could be referring generally to the truth of the gospel. I can't do anything against the gospel. Everything I do, every decision I make, all of my actions are for the sake of the gospel, for the advancement of the gospel. And that very well could be the right way to read this. It would be true of Paul. We know he was entirely sold out for the truth of the gospel, so much so that you got Paul sitting in a Roman prison waiting to, to appear before Caesar, right? And he hears, as he's writing to the Philippians, that there are people out there preaching the gospel for a whole bunch of reasons. He goes, yeah, some of them do it for legitimate reasons. Believe it or not, some of them are out there doing it just to spite me. And he's like, joke's on them. I don't care. As long as the gospel's being legitimately proclaimed, it's great. Go ahead and do that. So we know that Paul was committed to gospel truth, but... But in this immediate context, let's think about it. We have these series of tests. And so I think he has a narrower view in mind. I think he wishes to say, if the gospel is being lived out in Corinth, if the truth is at work in them, to the point that they're not doing wrong, but rather they're doing right, well then he could not and would not use his authority in a severe way. Why? Because to do so would be a violation of the truth. If their living lives reflective of the truth of the gospel, how could he come in and discipline them? He, he couldn't. He wouldn't. It would be dishonest of him. And to his overall point here, especially if that discipline was just to try to prove a point, I'm a legit apostle. I told you I could be harsh, and so now I'm going to be harsh. No. What a disingenuous motivation that would be. He's bound to the truth, to serving the truth, to proclaiming and preserving the truth even if that meant he looked weak and useless in the sight of men. He didn't care. And so that challenges us, right? How is your commitment to the truth of the gospel message and the implications on our daily lives? Because let's just be honest, far too many people are more than willing to water down the truth, to compromise it, as long as it doesn't make waves. And, and so nowadays, it's, oh, if I bring up the S word, if I say sin... They're going to get offended and tune me out. I better just stick to how Jesus is our friend. If I tell them that receiving Jesus means radical lifestyle changes, they're not going to want to hear that. They won't want to receive him. Self-help Jesus, that's my answer. Self-improvement Jesus. See, it's, it's wrong. It's insipid. It creeps in. That's not proclaiming the truth. It's suppressing the truth. And so let's be sure that we are so committed to the truth that we actually believe what Jesus said about it. What, what did Jesus say about truth? You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. If, if we believe that, then we ought to be unashamedly committed to it, no matter how we end up looking. And so after this little parenthetical aside from Paul, he 
he reframes his prayer because he's not done offering that prayer yet. The next thing to see is a prayer for restoration. So first, Paul prays, I don't want you to do anything wrong. I want you to do what's right. And it's not to make me and my companions look good. In fact, it might actually result in me looking worse, depending on who's observing and commenting. But I don't care. I'm going to act for the sake of the truth and only the truth. Now he wants to see the Corinthians restored to the truths they had once professed to receive, and for them to live in light of those. And so he says, For we rejoice whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And we pray for this, that you may become fully qualified. And so Paul returns to this juxtaposition of strength and weakness, power and weakness. He tells them, I don't care if we seem weak, as long as you are actually strong. Hey, I'll even rejoice if my perceived weakness results in strength for you. And so in context, the strength he envisions is that of standing firm in the faith, living the reality of Christ among them, doing what's right, and not what is wrong. But he frames it a little differently at the end of the verse. The, the net translates this word as fully qualified. I, I understand that translation. It has the idea of completeness, maturity. That's certainly a possibility. I titled this point the prayer for restoration. Now I want you to know, every week I choose the words in the outline very carefully. It's not just for alliterative effect. I think alliteration helps some people remember things, but I wanted to accurately reflect what the verse says as well. And so this particular word took a long time, and it shifted two or three times in my outline this week because, well, you see, if you survey all the translations of this verse, you're going to find an assortment of options. Things like, we pray for your perfection, for your perfecting, that you would be complete, that you would be mature, that you would be restored for your restoration. And so at one time, your outline read a prayer for maturation, maturity, right? Another time, it read a prayer for perfection, understanding that biblically speaking, perfection is bringing something to its appointed end, right? So, so why did I settle on restoration? Why do I think that's proper? Well, I really think in context it best captures the meaning of the word, because the noun here, translated fully qualified, it's only here, in the entirety of the New Testament. That's it. But the verb form of the word, well, that's used about 13 times in the New Testament. And it does have a broad range of meanings. It could include maturity and perfection, but the most common usage of the verb form of our phrase, fully qualified, has to do with mending, repairing, restoring something, making something fit for its purpose. In extra-biblical literature, the word was used to describe the setting of a broken bone by a doctor so that it could heal. If you read the Gospels, the word is used when the disciples are mending their nets, restoring their nets, bringing them back to functional condition. Paul uses that same verb in his letter to the Galatians. If, if you remember, he's addressing an issue of someone who has been caught up in a sin. This is his answer, Galatians 6.1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, then you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watching yourselves, lest you should be tempted. You should restore him. Same word. Bring him back to a place of usefulness. Help him to function as a Christian again. In our context, this usage seems to make the most sense. And it's fitting because this same verb I'm talking about, the verb form of, of this noun, it's going to be used in this letter in just two verses. You're going to hear it in more detail next week, Lord willing. But here's verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Set things right. Same verb. Set things right. Be encouraged. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of peace and love will be with you. You see it? Set things right. Same verb we've been talking about. And so here... Paul uses the noun form to describe the condition that he prays for them. Restored. Set right. He doesn't care what the personal cost to him is if this, if this is what happens. He will sacrifice status gladly if it means that the Corinthians are restored. Because right now, something is out of place. Something's wrong. They're, they're, they're still catering to the super apostles. They're still playing around with sin. They're not repenting of it personally. Perhaps they're looking the other way at each other's sin. 
Even their understanding of the gospel has to be restored. Remember what did Paul say earlier? These guys have preached to you another Christ and another gospel, and you're more than happy to receive it. He wants them to be restored. It's the prayer of Paul's heart. Time to set things right. I think our final verse of the morning backs that up nicely. The final thing to see this morning is Paul had a personal goal of edification. Of edification. And so all throughout this letter, Paul has expertly walked this tightrope, warning and encouragement, warning and encouragement. He's made it so clear his first choice is not to have another painful visit. He, he would rather avoid that altogether. In fact, remember what he said in the end of 12? I'm afraid that when I come, here's what I'm going to find. I'm afraid I won't find you what you like, want, and, and you won't find me what, excuse me, I won't find you what I want, you won't find me what you want. And so, he's been very transparent in these chapters. I'm willing to spend and be spent for you. I don't care what people think about me for you. I want you to get right with the Lord, not for my status, not for my sake, but for you, Corinthians. It's all for you. And so he says, because of this, I'm writing these things while absent. So that when I arrive, I may not have to deal harshly with you by using my authority. The Lord gave it to me for building up, not for tearing down. In chapter 10, Paul used an almost identical phrase when he spoke of the authority that God had given him as an apostle. He said it was for building up, not for tearing down. And now we almost have this, this bookend to this section of the letter where he says really the same exact thing. Back in chapter 10, he said, I, I don't want to have to tear you down like I tear down strongholds and arguments. That's not the primary purpose of my God-given authority. It's, it's to build you up, to edify you, to make you stronger in the faith in the way you live it out. And so now he's saying, hey, that's why I wrote you all this stuff now. There's no doubt it was hard for Paul to write these things. It would be hard for the Corinthians to hear them. But how much better for them to deal with these issues before he comes? If, if they could work together in community, to set right what had been put out of place by sin and false teachers, if they could work toward that restoration before Paul got there, just think about it. It's a totally different visit. You get to enjoy the benefits of his instruction rather than the rod of his discipline. And that's what he wants too. And now the warnings are all over. The cards are all on the table. The final preparations have been laid out before them, and the Corinthians could either choose to believe their spiritual father, their true apostle, or they could continue in doubt and skepticism and sin. And only time would tell what they would choose. But they could not claim that they had not been warned or that they were not deeply loved by this man. Friends, we have been repeatedly warned by God's word as well. And, and, and we are loved beyond comprehension by the one who became weak for our sakes. By the one who was crucified in weakness, but now lives by the power of God. And so the question is, have you heard the warning? And, and what will you do with it this morning? As a result of God's word, our next steps, practice self-examination. Are you in the faith? Is Christ in you? Have you received the gift of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus? Are you trusting in yourself? or entirely in him, in his life, his death, his resurrection, the fact that he ever lives to make intercession for you, and so he is able to save you to the uttermost. Are you trusting in that this morning? Does your conduct reflect your profession? And again, not perfection, direction, right? Pray for what is right. Pray that you would not do anything wrong, but rather what is right. Pray that you would be restored if that is what is needed this morning. Pray that, that God would reveal to you where perhaps you have come out of joint and need to be reset. And then once you have prayed those things for yourself, pray them for your brothers and sisters here, and then keep doing so. Finally, prize service over status. Are you willing to be misunderstood if it means the growth of others? Are, are, are you more concerned with the souls around you or the status you might try to protect? Friends, we have, we have to trust that God knows and sees. And you know what? He judges realities, 
not appearances. God doesn't give a rip about appearances. What is the reality of the heart of the servant before him? Do not grow weary in doing good, specifically the good work of serving others this morning. Let's pray.